London Bees made a statement about their intentions to compete amongst the best. Rachel Yankee, OBE, a legend of the women's game who has 129 England caps, is now in charge. Please, two, once you win it, okay, you win it three times, you're out. It wasn't something that I expected. Um, it wasn't something that I necessarily wanted at this moment in, in time. It's, it's difficult because of home life, having a, a young child. Um, it, it's, it's hard, but you know, you've got to do what you can and the opportunity was there. So we take it and we roll with it. And, and you know, I'm here to try and help the players. Ultimately, I'll be judged by general public, just like I was judged on the football pitch as a player uh, by the public and fans and whoever. Um, on results and you know but to me personally I know what we're trying to achieve and that's true to get better performances to get better individuals and, and more confident players four days after the news broke out it was time for Rachel's first league game as manager against London rivals Millwall Lionesses. started off the stronger of the two teams. Millwall struggled to clear the ball out of the box following a swinging cross on B's Ocean Rollinson. This allowed time for a composed Daisy McLaughlin to score the first goal of the game. There was a chance to double the B's lead just before the half hour mark, but Lauren Pickett's shot was disallowed following an offside call. In the closing stages of the first half, Millwall got one back. An audacious strike from Annie Rossiter found the back of the net after the Bees lost possession. The beginning of the second half nearly saw another Bees goal. McLaughlin's solo run from inside her own half resulted in a shot just wide of the Millwall post. Moments later, Ellie Wilson's header hits the post. Several missed chances for the Bees. Then it was Millwall's turn. Fantastic pass from Fran Alley sets up Evie Clark, who calmly slots it past Bees keeper Sarah Quintrell. A looping free kick from Beth Lumsden led to another Evie Clark goal for Millwall. This time, a superb volley.
Despite an important win for Millwall, Rachel Yankee's first league game in charge ends in disappointment. I think that we were quite quite slow. Um, I, I think we were quite sloppy in possession. Um, I think there were good parts. Some of our movement, some of our, uh, the goal was a good part of the game. Um, but uh, a lot, I think we know we need to gel a bit more and, and be a bit more fluent when we're attacking and when we're defending. I think it's been difficult. Obviously, change where, where Luke's um, gone over to the boys' side. Um, and uh, myself and Sean have, have, have tried to step up. And what we're trying to do is, is give the, uh, the players a, an understanding, a different way of thinking, and, and make them understand the different roles and responsibilities of how you play on the pitch. Um, they can all play, and they're a talented play, group of players. But uh, I think they can be a lot better, and we're trying to we're trying to make them better. That's uh, my, mine and Sean and George's job to, to make them better footballers. London Bees are a Barnet-based club competing in the second tier of women's football, the Championship. In recent years, there's been a significant growth in women's football, largely due to the rise in media coverage and an increase in popularity. For many, this is essentially a new era of women's football, particularly in the UK. I think your ball comes across as a risk. It's inviting to go in there. Yeah, safe side passing. Coming from, you know, in terms of when I started, so I started when I was like 10, 11, um, and then just growing up, you just kind of, you just play, and then as you get older, you notice things are changing, so there's like a new Barclays deal that's just come out, and that's a massive thing, um, and there's just more and more things that, are, that it's, it's getting there, it's getting where we want it to be, or where it needs to be. Um, coverage is getting a lot better. Um, but yeah, like we notice, I think you notice it more in terms of, say, like the amount of fans that come to your game, um, people that want to follow you on Twitter, sort of social media platforms, things like that, um, and just people generally asking. I think used to, you tell somebody that you play semi-professional football and they think, oh really, like who for? And they're like, oh, I didn't realise there was a team. Whereas now they're like, oh yeah, I know that. Or, oh, I've got a, a daughter that plays so and so. So it's, yeah, it's getting there. It's totally different to men's football. So it's like a sort of almost like a, a fresh look for football fans, if you like. Um, a lot of football fans, some of the football fans that come watch us, they generally just watch men's football and they quite enjoy coming to watch women's football because it's a lot more, um, less sort of, not cheating, but you know, there's that sort of diving element that's very more honest, it's, um, it's a lot less, slightly less aggressive I suppose than men, but it's just a different style of, of, of football and I think it's quite refreshing for just a, you know, general avid football fan. Yeah, so when I was a young girl, I actually played for a boys team. They were called Ice Lodge Hawks, and we were rubbish, so, so rubbish. But um, the lads were so sweet, always looked after me. I think I remember one game, like, the other team started kicking off, like, you shouldn't have a girl on your team. And I think we were, like, 10 years old, and one of my players like, went up, like, caused a bit of a <laughs> hoo-ha over it. So they were very protective. And since I've even, like, come into, like, women's football itself, which is nearly 10 years ago, the difference now... It's fantastic and I think the attention obviously there's so much more room for improvement but for now like the the spark of attention that's going is is great and I'm excited for like what the future generations might get to experience. All right, so I want you to think what positions you play. So it might be the centre back passing out to a fullback. So the quality of your pass and then the fullback can you get on? Okay, can you lose that player? Yes, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. I look back at my playing career when I, I made my debut for England when I was 17. Um, that was England, the first team. There wasn't any youth age groups, so there was the only place for me to go was sink or swim at the top. Um, now there's a, there's a whole pathway, so the education for players can be so much more. Um, the, the resources that players can have, um, like I say, when, when, when I was younger, you, you'd come in, you'd train. We trained as part time, so you'd, you'd play, train two times a week. And then you'd go, you're learning, you were, you were there with your, with your coach, you didn't have strength and conditioning coaches, you didn't have nutritionists at the top level, you know, you didn't have like physios that were constantly there and, and psychologists at the top level, you've got all that and um, it makes a massive difference and uh, those are the changes that a player now that's playing can really access all of that wealth of knowledge from other people 
and that will make them a better, a better, a better footballer. The professionalism of the women's game is very topical in today's society. With London Bees being in the championship, the players are only semi-professional. This contrasts greatly to those competing in the WSL1 and the newly formed championship side, Manchester United, who are professional. Many London Bees players have to balance life as a footballer whilst also having other jobs. From a coaching perspective, this greatly affects the amount of contact time with players. I understand that it needs to be sustainable to play full time. Like obviously, for any footballer, it would be amazing. But I understand how like the model of the game work and how the championship works. That like, you need to get more bums on seats, more sponsorship in the game to pay the players. Obviously, it'd be amazing if we all had like an endless pot of money. And then I'd be like, yes, make us pro, make us pro, all leagues. But for now, I understand it. I think the league's driving towards that sustainability and hopefully in the future years there'll be more than just the one professional league. As a player, you know, I've played part-time and I've played full-time and, and the, the, the difference is huge. You know, the contact time that you can have with a football, with your teammates if you're full-time uh, compared to, to being part-time, is uh, it, it makes a difference. Um, as a coach, of course it makes a difference because we have to prioritise the information that we're given. Uh, we, we can't we can't tell them everything and do everything that we want to do because there's just not enough time. Um, so, I mean, it's, it makes us think and, and work in different ways with uh, video analysis, sending out messages, getting that across to players in, in different ways. Obviously, strength and conditioning. Where we, you have to trust that the players will do the conditioning programmes on their own and, and the days that they can come in here and work with the strength and conditioning coach to do it there. But, also, you've got to be respected that they work full-time jobs and we don't want anybody to burn out because they're doing a full-time job and then come in here training afterwards, not eating the right foods, not getting the right rest, because all that really does, does matter. As a full-time athlete, you know, it's, it's, it's there, it's in your programme, you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, you get the right recovery, sleep is, sleep is huge and I think, um, you know, people often, often miss that out of, of a full-time athlete, it's, uh, it's, it's a great benefit. Merrick Will has learnt how to balance two important aspects of her life. Whilst also playing for London Bees, she's currently studying at university. So it's usually sort of get up around sort of eight-ish um, and then leave around nine o'clock um, for my sort of ten o'clock lectures which is regularly what I have they generally start at ten um, and then have lectures um, and do work throughout the day um, I then have work sort of around three o'clock because um, I work as a nanny so I have to go and pick up the, the kids that I look after and then I'll work until about six o'clock Um, so I go to Bruno University, um, I study sports psychology, um, I'm currently in my second year, um, so it's, uh, in terms of juggling it with football and work, it's, it's quite a lot, but if you're organised, you can do it. Um, you have to plan your time carefully, knowing when you can and you can't revise, and when, when to just fit different things in, really, if you have so much stuff going on, it's mainly about organising when, when and where you can do that and sorting out your blocks. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's a lot it's a lot to handle, um, but it's something that I want to do. I still want to keep playing some professional football, and that's something that I have to do alongside my studies. So um, so yeah, it's just something you have to fit in into your time and just plan it well and stay organised, and you can do it. So our student union. I mean it's 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 not nice to miss out on things. Um, I, you can still find time to hang around with your friends and stuff, but. You know, if you play some professional football, it's kind of like you can't, but it's not. I don't feel like I'm missing out because it's what I want to do. So it's just a decision, a choice that you have to make, really. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, for me, as I'm, I'm a sports scholar, so I play for the uni team as well. So, um, like, a typical week is, like, training sort of Monday and then playing for B's training Tuesday. 
I then have a uni game Wednesday, um, train for B's Thursday, and then train for uni Friday. Um, and then we had the of like every other week we train for B's on Saturday as well, and then play on a Sunday. So um, in terms of my week, it's quite hectic. Um, but as I said, if you your organisation is key, um, it's obviously a lot to do, and I'm like tired all the time, but. Um, it sort of it, it helps with my fitness, so it's not something that I'm missing out on. It's um, it's beneficial, but it's just again sorting out, organising your time well, planning things so you know when and where you've got time to revise and stuff. Because obviously I have to fit study in as well um, alongside work. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's difficult, but it's something that I want to do. So um, yeah, you just work around it, and I still enjoy it. So that's the best. That's the good thing. Following the success at the 2015 World Cup and other recent tournaments, women's football in the UK has progressed massively. It is certainly exciting to see how it can develop more in the coming years. But what more needs to be done to project women's football further onto the world stage? I suppose signing a TV deal that more games are shown more often. I think it's fantastic that like if they don't get it on TV, it's maybe on Facebook or like Twitter people go or they put it straight live on YouTube. I think that's fantastic. At the moment, it's just you need to create brand awareness and push it out in front of people. And then once you've convinced people that look, look at this amazing sport we can get into to watch, then you can start having more TV deals, like buying in that way. It just takes time for people to, to just grow into it almost really because it's such a different, it's different to the men's game. but. Football fans are football fans, they're fans of football, not of a, a gender of who plays football um, and it's a different type of game and people have said that they really enjoy it. I really think it's going to, next five, ten years I think it will really sort of hit off and then ideally um, we have sort of, you know, two tiers of full time, time football would be great. Women's football needs to, to look at itself as a, as a business and I've, I've always said this, it, it needs to be fighting out there. I think it's fantastic that you've got Barclays that have come on board. Obviously, at the top league, at the WSL One, they are now sponsoring that. And the rewards will be, uh, you know, for those teams, obviously money-wise, it will be fantastic for them. Um, but other companies recognising what Barclays are doing and wanting to look, come on board because they see women's football as a business opportunity and it, and it needs to be seen like that. Will it filter down into the lower leagues? That's a question that, that obviously we have to ask and, and, and see what happens. Getting bums on seats and selling tickets, if, if that doesn't happen, then you know, how can the game be sustainable and how can it be you know, fully full-time? Like We want to see it, but the football that's on show has, has got to be exciting to the public to want to watch. Uh, but the potential is huge because if you, if you take like, the men's football or the premiership, it's, it's already there. How much higher can it go? Women's football is there and it's always growing. So there's fantastic potential, but um, somebody cleverer than I am needs to put that business side of it um, into action and, and make it work.